The Moon Jar by Dan Cook I had no idea there was a booger hanging from my nose, but strangely Monique didn't seem to mind. She just gazed dreamily into my eyes and asked if I'd like to come back to her place. I should have known then that she wasn't like other girls. We'd met an hour earlier at a Radio Shack store. I was shopping for parts for my latest invention, a computer interface that would control a sprinkler system by monitoring the moisture content of a lawn. She strolled in wearing a clingy black dress that left little to the imagination. I couldn't help noticing her. She looked more like a model than an electronics buff. After a moment of thoughtful browsing, she approached me and asked, Where do you keep your batteries? Sorry, I don't work here, I replied. Well, you look like you know a lot about electricity. I ought to, I said proudly. I'm an inventor. Always the opportunist, I attempted to impress her with my vast knowledge of circuits, resistors, rectifiers, and the ever-popular light-emitting diode. Surprisingly, it worked. In fact, she was so impressed with my technical mumbo-jumbo that she asked to continue our discussion over coffee. For the next hour, we talked about my inventions. I specialize in developing interfaces that allow computers to react to outside stimulus. Monique was particularly interested in finding out if it was possible to develop an interface that could transfer computer data directly into a person's mind. I told her it was probably possible, but that we are light years away from developing that kind of technology. She just smiled. A moment later we left the coffee shop and returned to our cars. There was an awkward moment of silence as we stood there not wanting to say goodbye. That's when she invited me back to her place. She even offered to let me drive her little red sports car. While adjusting the rearview mirror, I noticed the booger that had been hanging from my nose. I quickly turned my head away from Monique and grabbed it between my thumb and index finger. She just fumbled around in her purse, pretending not to notice. I thought about rolling down the window and throwing the booger out, but I didn't want to draw attention to my embarrassing predicament. For the same reason, I opted not to ask for a tissue. If we'd been in my car, I would have wiped it under the seat, but we weren't, so I rolled it between my fingers and continued searching for an adequate method of disposal. I briefly considered putting it in my pocket, but that was too disgusting. Finally, I glanced down at my shoes. They were the perfect hiding place. The booger would stick there for a while, but eventually it would dry up and fall off. I glanced over at Monique. She was still digging through her purse. Stealthily, I reached down and wiped the booger onto my shoelaces. Then I placed both hands on the wheel and breathed a sigh of relief. As if on cue, Monique closed her purse and asked, Well, are we all set? You bet, I said as I threw the car into gear and pulled out into the flow of traffic. When we arrived at her apartment, there was a party going on. Come on, Monique said. I'll introduce you to my friends. First, we met a feeble-looking electrical engineer dancing with a gorgeous redhead. Next, a guy working toward his doctorate in mathematics. He wore a wrinkly striped shirt, and the hair on the right side of his head stood straight up. A tall Asian lady was feeding him grapes. We continued around the room and met a marine biologist, a physicist, and a high school chemistry teacher, each man a little dorkier than the previous, and each with a beautiful woman at his side. I was confused. Nerds and beautiful women don't usually mix. I started to ask Monique why she and her friends didn't set their standards a little higher, but the sight of my uniquely decorated shoelaces stopped me. As painful as it was to admit to myself, I fit right in at that party. This sure is an interesting mix of people, I said. We all belong to the same club, Monique confided. A sort of science modeling club. You're kidding, right? No, seriously. We're just a bunch of scientists and models who get together and have fun. Would you like to join us? Life had taught me that beautiful women usually have an ulterior motive when associating with socially inferior men. Monique just smiled and waited patiently for an answer. What's the catch? I asked. No catch. We just think smart men are sexy. Just then the door opened and in walked six nerdy men wearing speedos accompanied by six curvy models in very small bikinis. I'll give it a try, I said. An hour later the party broke up. Once the others had gone, Monique invited me into her bedroom. As we passed through the door, I noticed a large electrical contraption sitting in the middle of her floor. It was a wooden box covered in circuit boards and lights with an egg-beater-shaped metallic antenna-like thing sticking three feet out of the top. Wow! What is it? I asked while moving in for a closer look. Monique smiled shyly and replied, It's a little project we've been working on. I think it's almost finished. 
It looks pretty complicated, I told her. What does it do? I'm not really sure, Monique admitted, but the guys know. They're the ones who put it together. As I studied the device, Monique walked to her dresser and said, Here's something I do know about. She gestured toward a strange-looking glass sphere. It was about a foot across and filled with something that resembled Swiss cheese. Light bounced off it in such a way that it seemed to glow softly from within. This is my moon jar, Monique said. Your what? My moon jar, she repeated. I found it one day while jogging in the park. What does it do? Just put your hands on it like this, she said. It makes you feel really good. The orb seemed to glow and pulsate rhythmically as she ran her fingers across its surface. Why moon jar, I asked. Because it looks like the moon, silly, she giggled a little and then began to moan with pleasure. Why don't you come over here and give it a try? She didn't have to ask twice. My palms tingled slightly as I rested them opposite hers on the orb, but it was nothing to get excited about. I felt foolish and would have stopped if it weren't for Monique. She seemed to be deriving what could only be described as sexual pleasure from it, so I stuck around to see what would happen next. The tingly feeling entered the soles of my feet and gradually migrated up my legs. Within a minute or two, every inch of skin on my body had become ultra-sensitive. Eventually the sensation changed, and I imagined something was exploring every nook and cranny of my mind. Then instantly, it all made sense. I opened my eyes and saw Monique sitting on the floor, glossy-eyed and looking very satisfied. The moon jar was a biological computer sent here by a superior life form from a distant planet. I wasn't sure of exactly how I knew this, but I was sure it was true. I placed my hands back on the orb and it began to communicate with me, not with words, but rather with ideas. Information filled my mind at an incredible rate, a thousand times faster than would be possible with human speech. The aliens were highly intelligent aquatic creatures similar to an octopus. I could picture one clearly in my mind. It had a large flexible head containing a brain the size of a beach ball and was symmetrically divided into three equal sections. Each section contained an eye and three arms. The eyes were large and complex, providing excellent vision. The arms were muscular and menacing. Of the three arms on each section, the center was the largest at 20 feet in length and was tipped with two inwardly curved spikes. The secondary arms were half as long and had stubby three-fingered hands. All nine of the arms were lined with suction cups. At the center of the creature's underside was its mouth, which consisted of a powerful tri-billed beak and a tongue covered with razor-sharp teeth. It was a horrific sight, and fear momentarily overwhelmed me. Sensing this, the moon jar began feeding me new information. I discovered that the aliens were benevolent social creatures who lived in close-knit family groups. They communicated by touching one another to exchange mild bioelectric currents that carry ideas directly from one mind to another. They were once ruthlessly efficient hunters, but technological advancements had made the practice obsolete. Their one weakness was that their method of direct brain-to-brain -brain communication required actual physical contact. This made long-distance communication impossible. Eventually, their scientists were able to develop biological computers which were self-contained, genetically engineered brains living within glass-like spheres. In other words, moon jars. The moon jars could be connected to amplifying antennas which permitted the aliens to transmit their thoughts over great distances. The fact that less intelligent creatures could be controlled with this technology was just a welcome coincidence. All of this information and much more was downloaded into my mind in a fraction of a second. I knew the aliens had sent hundreds of moon jars out into space in search of new planets to colonize. The orb had used Monique and her friends to recruit brainy guys who could build an antenna that would enable it to communicate with our people, and more importantly, to summon the aliens who had sent it. Since the aliens were aquatic creatures, I assumed they posed no threat to humans. Having this thought in mind, and eager to impress Monique, I set out to develop an interface that would connect the moon jar to the antenna. With the orb's help, I made rapid progress, and each day I learned a little more about the aliens. They place the environmental health of their planet before all else and despise beings who pollute and overpopulate. When the orb sensed I felt the same way, it told me the aliens planned to improve the ecological condition of our planet. This made me happy until they filled in the details. They planned to reduce the human population by using people as their main source of food. 
They easily hypnotize land animals and march them into the sea like lemmings. Upon learning this, I immediately pulled away, breaking contact with the orb. For the next hour, I just sat there, feeling sick to my stomach. The aliens viewed humans as mere livestock, and I was helping them to conquer the planet. I couldn't believe what a fool I'd been and vowed to destroy the moon jar before the interface was completed. I knew it couldn't read my thoughts as long as I wasn't touching it, so I stepped into action. After briefly surveying the situation, I grabbed the heaviest weapon at my disposal, the solid brass lamp from the desk where I'd been working, raised it high over my head, and smashed down onto the glass ball with all of my strength. A sharp bolt of pain shot through my body when the lamp came into contact with the orb. I fell backward onto Monique's bed, and the lamp bounced across the floor, but the moon jar remained intact, glowing defiantly. Through the throbbing pain in my head, I could make out a message that had been delivered directly into my mind. The orb made it quite clear that I was to complete the interface, or it would find someone else to do it, and then have me killed. If I cooperated, on the other hand, I would have a prosperous life with a harem of beautiful women, cheerfully striving to satisfy my every desire. Given the options, I reluctantly agreed to resume work on the interface, but in the back of my mind, I secretly plotted to destroy the moon jar. It's difficult to keep a secret from a computer that can read your every thought, so we developed a sort of game. I thought up ways of destroying it, and the moon jar explained why they wouldn't work. It turns out the orb was made of a super strong material that could withstand fire, electrical shock, gunshots, acid, and even explosions. Eventually, I ran out of ideas and resigned myself to the fact that I'd have to get used to being waited on by beautiful women for the rest of my life. Finally, one day, my work on the interface was completed. I placed my hands on the moon jar, and it showed me how to make the final connections. I visualized a small door materializing and opening on the underside of the sphere. Inside, a thin yellow membrane protected the brain and its fluid from the outside air. On the membrane were three small teat-like extremities to which I would connect the interface's wires using alligator clips. I removed my hands from the sphere and began preparing the wires. Just as I had visualized, a small door opened and the fleshy underbelly of the orb was exposed. I was about to connect the first wire when Monique entered the room wearing a French maid costume and carrying a pan of brownies. The moon jar told me brownies are your favorite, she said, while dishing up a piece for me. Well, I guess it would know, I replied, feeling defeated. I shoved the brownie into my mouth and used the metal spatula to scoop up another. After eating the second piece, I glanced down at the apparently vulnerable orb. Without hesitation, I plunged the brownie-soiled spatula through the exposed flesh and into the brain itself. A familiar wave of pain shot through my body as I fell to my knees and watched a yellow gelatinous fluid ooze from the wound and on to Monique's dresser. The orb tried in vain to close its door, but the spatula was in the way. It pulsated frantically at first, but gradually the light dimmed, and it died. I couldn't believe it was true. I had actually saved the world. I stood up, shook the cobwebs out of my head, and smiled a hero's smile. Then I glanced over at Monique. You little creep, she screamed. You broke my moon jar. Uh, sorry, but I had no choice, I tried to explain. Just get out of here, she yelled. I should have known better than to hang out with a bunch of nerds. With that, she began throwing things at me, so I ran out the door and didn't look back. On the way home, I passed several houses with dried-out lawns. I couldn't wait to get back to work on my sprinkler system.